Hello and welcome again to our series Leaders in Medicine. Today I'm at the University of Cape Town Medical School where it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Professor Vanessa Birch. Vanessa is Professor of Medicine and the Clinical Lead for Medicine here at the Grotesker University Hospital and she's also the Director of the Clinical MBBS program here. Vanessa, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. Vanessa, I always start with the same question, which is, why did you become a doctor? How did you develop a career in medicine? Well, I think it's an interesting story. I come from a working class background. My dad was a tradesman and, and my mom ran the household. And I started to become interested in medicine when I did a school project as a small girl uh, on Florence Nightingale. And I was fascinated by her story and her dedication. And it was then that I really got interested in looking after people who were injured or ill or not well. Um, and what I was most concerned about was the limited resources she had as I read her story and did my project. And it really started off as a kind of general interest in health care. Specifically to become a doctor within that context was really a fascination with more details of the human body. So on the one side it was issues around health care and the other side was just plain fascination. I was interested in how we were put together and how we worked. So that's really where it came from. I think when I suggested it to my folks, they really uh, were completely perplexed by the issue and said, where did I come up with this idea? How on earth are we going to afford this? And which medical school are we going to send you to if indeed you can get into a medical school? So it was an interesting start. I first had to get my folks around the idea. Uh, we then agreed that I couldn't leave uh, the province to go to medical school. And then, of course, we went through the process where my dad said, well, do your best in the interview, but remember that we don't expect you to get in. So that was a bit of a surprise for them when I did, uh, and it really started after that. So where did you study medicine? Uh, I did my undergraduate training at Witwatersrand University, which is in Johannesburg. And as I say, my folks had a, a radius of 50 kilometers, and it fell within the 50 kilometers, so I was really lucky. Uh, the other university was an Afrikaans-speaking uh, university in my hometown. Although Afrikaans was my first language, I preferred to study in English, so that's why I went to Witwatersrand, where I did all my undergraduate training. My postgraduate training I came to do in Cape Town, so I did all my postgrad work here. Yeah. And you're a rheumatologist. So what interested you in rheumatology as a specialty? I think as I did my training, what I recognized in rheumatologists were people who had a very broad base to their medicine. Mm -hmm. You really had to have a very good insight into multi-system disease. And I was quite bored in some specialties where one focused really just on the function of one organ. So I preferred a multidisciplinary, uh, at least across all the disciplines kind of uh, specialty. And I think rheumatology answered that question for me and addressed that need. And medical education, was that a sort of sequential career track or did it run in parallel? It ran in parallel. I think uh, I enjoyed teaching as an undergraduate even to my classmates. Uh, and I was often asked to explain things and, and I enjoyed that. When I got to Cape Town to start my postgraduate training, I was very quickly roped into teaching because people saw I had an interest. And it developed completely in parallel, um, almost at the same pace. So I was doing quite a lot of undergrad teaching as a, as a young registrar. Once I'd completed my specialization, I was given more and more responsibilities, becoming course conveners and eventually uh, moving on from there. But it was really a career that was always in parallel with my clinical work. Here in Cape Town, or indeed in South Africa as a whole, is medical education really a sort of a, a woman's role? It's an interesting question. Uh, I can answer it in one way by saying at our recent National Medical Education Conference about 70 percent of participants were women. Mm -hmm. So I think it is a profession uh, or an aspect of the profession where there are a lot of women in medicine uh, doing medical education. We are increasingly seeing men become interested in the discipline as well. But I think a lot of undergraduate education requires nurturing, and I suppose mm -hmm. women nurture more than men do. This thing may not be true, but I think that's my I kind think. of feeling about it. Oh, I think that's probably very true. Now, you're undergoing a clinical curriculum review at the moment, which is a really big, complex process, I know. 
so obviously there's a lot of leadership and direction required. So what do you think are the key leadership skills that are needed in managing change like a curriculum change? I think leadership skills is probably an area where we are the most lacking in terms of medical education. We know how to be doctors and we can learn how to be teachers. Learning how to be a leader I think is something that's sorely neglected both in undergraduate as well as in postgraduate training. And I think it's essential because when one starts moving in the direction of curriculum reform, curriculum revision, any kind of change, you really do need to know what you're doing. And I think the key leadership skills that one needs to have is really the ability to bring people along with you mm -hmm. and alongside you. The reform processes that I've seen that don't work is where someone hatches a plan and then tries to sell it to everyone else and they don't buy the plan and things just go wrong from there. So bringing people not only with you in the terms of the idea but alongside you in terms of collaboration. Otherwise you find yourself doing all the work on your own. So you really do need a team of people. And both of those are skills which, they come with time, but I think teaching some of those skills would shorten the lag phase for people to emerge as leaders. Indeed, indeed. Now that obviously involves a lot of strategy setting, but your own role here in the university, does that also have a, a strategic perspective? Are you able to contribute to the, the, the wider plans of the bigger medical school, meaning at the, the university medical school as opposed to the MBBS program? The answer is yes. The process has been slow. I think uh, 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, when I started uh, working in medical education, the strategy in terms of from, from the point of view of the teachers uh, was, was fairly limited. There was a broad university management and that really was what ran the show. The university as a whole has taken teaching and learning on as an important agenda in parallel with its mm -hmm. research agenda in fact. And so roles for teachers and, and, uh, and faculty who are involved in education have become much more prominent and people are now uh, assigned roles where they do in fact have strategic management direction and initiative. So as director of the MBCHB program, I very, very much sit in a position where I can make decisions where they do influence the, uh, the future of the medical school program. And we work very closely now in an education team with the dean and the deputy dean. There's now a deputy dean of education. And so our process feeds right into that. And in fact, we do have an influence on how the processes go and, and what happens. Vanessa, you obviously have a very important role in the MBCHB programme here. How did your appointment come about for that post? Well, when I was looking at promotion to associate professor and ultimately to full professor, uh, there were a set of university criteria for ad hominem promotion. And teaching featured in that, but really in a fairly minor way. And the university then took on a process that, saying that teachers had to be recognised for their contribution and that formally in the process of, of ad hominem promotion it was included as one of the criteria with quite specific uh, criteria to be met in that uh, domain of promotion mm -hmm. uh, application. And I think I was probably a test case. I was one of the first people who was promoted largely on the basis of my education mm -hmm. background both in research as well as my commitment and uh, contribution to the university. So that was the process. Um, and I think since then we've come a, a good way along the track and more people are being promoted on that basis. So that's really very exciting that the university holds teaching in parallel with research at the same level in terms of promotion. Now if you were to look into the future and think about what medical education might be like here in 10, 15 years time, what's, what's, what do you think is going, going to happen? Well, I would love to have all clinicians trained as teachers, mm -hmm. uh, particularly those who are very interested. I think there's some people who are not suited to teaching. It really doesn't interest mm -hmm. them. But if I had a wish, it would be that all of those interested in teaching have some form of training uh, at a certain, certainly to a degree where one would be comfortable with looking at the literature and a lot of innovation could be brought in. So I think that's one of the things I'd really like to see. The other thing is that the discipline is growing slowly, but it is growing. Uh, we have a fair cohort of educators now around the country. And I think what we need is the next move into the international arena. So one is looking at saying, 
yes, we a cohort, we're a critical mass now, but can we start having a, a role um, internationally mm -hmm. on a wider basis? So more international collaboration would be my second big wish. That's great. Vanessa, it's great to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time today. It's a pleasure. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you.